Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started again after our afternoon break, so please come on back in. I have the distinct pleasure this afternoon to introduce um, a panel of very, very distinguished guests. Um, my name is Anna Siefkin. I have met some of you before during the course of today. I'm the Associate Director for Innovation and Strategic Partnerships with the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation at Carnegie Mellon. Quite a mouthful. It's a great job and an opportunity to meet all of you. So I work day in and day out to bring together partnerships um, and, and create synergies uh, where possibly they did not exist before. And so as a part of that, we have brought together this very esteemed panel on public-private partnerships, activating city, utility, and university engagement. So today I welcome to the stage uh, Grant Irvin, who's the Chief Resilience Officer and Assistant Director for the Department of City Planning, uh, City of Pittsburgh, at the far end. He's our moderator today. So Grant serves as the Chief Resilience Officer, where he oversees the integration of sustainability and resilience into city services, programs, and policy, and is a great partner to Carnegie Mellon University. Um, Jason Anderson is in the middle. He's the president and CEO of Clean Tech San Diego, uh, which is a nonprofit organization for members, which includes more than 100 local businesses, universities, government, and nonprofits committed to advancing sustainable solutions for the benefit of the economy and the environment. As president and CEO, Jason manages, uh, uh, manages and leads several initiatives, including Smart City San Diego, advocacy efforts, and economic development programs. Um, Philip Macy is further down in, in the middle. He is the president and CEO of ITRON. Um, he is an industry visionary working to drive digital transformation in the utility space. During his tenure at ITRON, the company has grown from a metering technology provider to a leader in the Internet of Things, connecting smart devices to, manage, to better manage resources. ITRON is a leader in the energy and water sectors and Maisie helps drive the dialogue around utilizing technology and data to create more connected, vibrant, efficient, and safer utilities and cities. David Owens joins us as well. He is the retired executive vice president of Edison Electric Institute. He's an accomplished executive with extensive experience in public policies surrounding utility operations, strategic planning, technology development, rate making, and regulation. He retired from EEI last year, but he remains an advisor to EEI and serves on the board of Excel Energy. He also chairs the Transformation Advisory Council, providing insights in the new design of the Puerto Rico electric systems. From what I understand, he has hardly retired at all. Uh, and finally, we have Rich Riazzi, President and CEO of Duquesne Light Company here in Pittsburgh. He serves as the President and Chief Executive Officer in Duquesne Light and Duquesne Light Company and the holding companies. Under Riazzi's leadership, the company invested significant resources to ensure that its infrastructure, the wires, substation, poles, and other equipment that make the company's transmission and distribution system meets current and future electric demands. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Grant, and our esteemed panel. Great. Thank you, Anna. Uh, and thank you all for, uh, for joining us here this afternoon for this really great panel. Uh, and thank you all, gentlemen, for uh, coming to Pittsburgh, uh, the three of you. And Rich, uh, Rich is the, he's the hometown entertainment here. So, um, so it's great to spend, a, you know, spend an afternoon with you guys and, and talking about some really innovative things. Um, just a little bit of context, I guess, for why this panel. Uh, Anna and I have the pleasure of, of hosting a class this semester here at uh, Carnegie Mellon on kind of exactly this topic, really looking at the issues of smart cities and the integration of smart city data and utilities. And when we started to conceptualize this, I think one of the things that really became uh, one of the hallmarks of the conversation was the need for partnerships and the need for dialogue. Um, and as I just, you know, kind of look down the line, one of the things is I've had the pleasure of meeting each of these individuals and having kind of an opportunity to share space and time with them, um, either on different panels or, or just using kind of your guidance and some of the work that we are doing here in the city of Pittsburgh. And, and it really starts me off kind of the, the first question that, that I wanted to kind of ask everyone is, you know, you're seeing a lot of synergies right now in this space between 
cities and utilities and universities. And, and, and the reason, I think, is because there's, there's big challenges that are out there that all of our, our respective sectors are encountering, whether it's issues of climate change or uh, managing product loss or integrating technology uh, into our business platforms. We're, we're confronting the same questions at the same time. But maybe starting with you, Philip, in terms of kind of what you're seeing in terms of, uh, you know, ITRON and kind of the work that you guys do around the world, kind of nationally, globally, why are these synergies occurring between universities and private sector partners like utilities uh, and, and cities? Like, what, what, what is the confluence and what's leading to that? Well, I mean, for years people have been talking about the proliferation of sensors and the proliferation of data that's generated by those sensors. What we don't talk about as much is, is that uh, uh, there is a lot of work that needs to go into building um, uh, economical, reliable, accurate sensing devices out in the field. So there's, there's continued research required in order to do that. How we connect those sensors back to the home office, how we operate those networks, and for goodness sake, what do we do with all the data that we're collecting through these networks are just these pressing problems where we're sort of making it up as we go along. Um, and, and requires a lot of collaborative work and collaborative thinking, uh, particularly with universities. Uh, building these kinds of data, large data networks and data analytics capability um, requires significant investment. And the idea that there is a complete overlap in, in building infrastructure out across uh, municipalities, primarily for us water utilities, uh, electric and gas utilities doesn't seem particularly uh, resourceful or practical to have this sort of duplication and overlap. So uh, we spend a lot of time working with multiple stakeholders in, in urban environments, uh, really trying to explore how it is that we can better share uh, network uh, resources and, and collaborate more effectively on driving more value out of data, which requires really this kind of collaborative environment we're talking about. Thank you, Grant. And, you know, from San Diego's perspective, um, and apology for being the Californian in the room. Um, and also the purveyor of fine socks. There you go. Um, so from San Diego's perspective, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're kind of the cul-de-sac of California. We're at the bottom of the state. Uh, we're surrounded by the ocean, the desert, and another country. And so for us, you know, the collaboration is really just kind of built into our culture. It's just a way we do things in San Diego. And when Cleantech San Diego was launched uh, 11 years ago, it was really that mindset around how do we bring the academic universities, institutions to the table with the private sector, the public agencies, and our one, we have one IOU, uh, San Diego Gas and Electric in our region, to really think about these kind of solutions, these problems from a regional perspective where we all have kind of a stake in the game. For us, when we now start thinking about data and how you know, the, this kind of collaboration around data comes together, I know someone in the previous panel talked about the, the pilot project in Atlanta around streetlights and sensors. Um, we're doing the same thing in San Diego. We've got 3,400 sensors that are being installed in our community um, on streetlights by Current and AT&T. And that's pushing out an amazing amount of data that, again, we have really no idea what to do with. Um, but what everyone cares in this collaboration is, is economic development. How are we creating jobs? How are we benefiting our local economy? What's the result to our local environment, our, our global environment? Um, and so all this data has turned into just a really interesting set of tools that app developers are using to develop applications, and those are creating jobs. And it's just this kind of interesting kind of confluence um, of all these different interested parties. So for us, you know, we're all coming together in San Diego because we believe there are uh, significant climate opportunities, cl challenges that we need to, that we're facing, and that we believe that technology plays a significant role in addressing those, um, but there's a huge economic opportunity for that as well. So as we really think about data and pushing data out into the community, uh, the city of San Diego has an open data portal. It's really about who's gonna take that data and do what with it and create a next, you know, the next economic engine for San Diego. Interesting. David? So let, let me respond. <clears throat> Let me respond differently uh, to the question. Excellent question. I do agree with my colleagues, their response. So let's take an example of what's happening in the electric industry. So right now, we have 75 million smart meters that have been installed throughout the utility systems in America. We have 220 million customers that the private sector serves. So tremendous number of customers have smart meters. 
Those smart meters have AMI, so that means that there's data that comes from those smart meters that can help that utility plan and understand uh, when a customer loses service. Some customers, particularly in San Diego and other sunny areas, have rooftop solar. Those rooftop solars have smart inverters. Those smart inverters provide a lot of information about the customer's behavior. So does a smart meter. Some of those customers in San Diego also have electric vehicles. Those electric vehicles have charging stations that provide a lot of information. All of these technologies provide tremendous data that could be very helpful to the utility as it seeks to plan and operate its system. Universities are part of that customer base that the utility serves. So one good example would be if I looked at what's occurring, and actually Phil is doing it, uh, in Spokane, Washington, uh, where they're working with the universities, where the universities are taking the viewpoint, we have three objectives that we want to accomplish, much like the utility has these same objectives. We want reliability. We want efficiency or affordability and we want to improve sustainability. So those are the three areas that are driving a lot of the need to collaborate and to use this data in a very useful way. Right now the data is very unstructured. We get reams of data as a utility, but we don't structure that data. I haven't even spoken about monitors and sensors that are throughout the utility system as we begin to convert our substations so those substations are much smarter, more analytic, and more data driven. So we're moving into a society where technology is producing data and we need to have a way that we are able to structure that data and make that data much more useful. That's why collaboration is essential. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll approach it a little bit differently. Um, being a privately held company, we have investors that expect a return on our investment. And I think, you know, we have to overcome some of the business challenges and how do we develop a sustainable model at the end of the day. I think, you know, this unique time that we live in and these partnerships uh, that are coming together are one being driven by a common vision, right? That vision that we have to uh, work and live much more sustainably than we have, have in the past. Two, I think you heard some of the other earlier panel speakers uh, talk about uh, the G to accelerate this, we have some inertia ahead of us because the economics aren't always there. So how do you overcome that inertia? Uh, the unique partnerships that we're talking about, I think, afford us the opportunity to do that. So as we think about smart cities, uh, we think that they're underpinned by three pillars. Uh, the first pillar is you have to cost effectively deploy all the sensors that are out in the field to gather that data. The second pillar then is you have to develop a communication network so you can collect all that data and move it up to the cloud. The third pillar then is that you have open access to that data so that we can take the folks that have the intellectual capability at the universities that have a forward lean on that technology and forward thinking to develop the tools that we need so that we can operate and take that data and make effective economic use out of it. So having said that then, when you look at the partnerships that are evolving between universities, between utilities, between cities, uh, we all have assets in the field. The city's a big consumer of some of the information that will come out of this to help them operate more efficiently. As a utility, we're a platform operator. So we have lots of sensors in the field today. We have controls in the field to manage. You'll hear about that a little bit later from some of the other panel participants. So we have that expertise that's there. We've developed communication networks to gather all of that data. <clears throat> So as was said here, you don't want to replicate those investments over and over. You want to leverage the assets between all the players that are at the table. So we need to leverage and contribute our, uh, our infrastructure assets and our knowledge to the table. We partner with the universities to tap into that intellectual base. We tap into the city to interface with them and provide you know, products and services to them as well. Yeah. So I want to jump right off of one of the things that you just said when you were talking about leveraging assets. Because one of the things that we've done with the class this semester, and, and many of the students are here with us today, so they're, I'm sure, going to be, going to be listening uh, very carefully and intently, hi, is that um, we do have an opportunity, particularly in a city that is rebuilding, as we are, or at a, at a point of infrastructure improvement, to really take that opportunity to um, 
capitalize across utilities. And so that's really what we're thinking about um, as a part of the class is how can we actually create um, an ROI, what makes sense for each individual player within a city to um, make those invest investments and, and investigate that data um, together. So that's really sort of what we've been looking at. You know, maybe to pick up on that, I was gonna ask you guys, I'm gonna throw a curveball at you and start with Anna. You know, one of the things that we talked about uh, in preparing for this was, you know, what are some of the hallmarks of a strong partnership? So that's the easy question, but like, you know, through the class and some of the things that we've discovered, what are some of the challenges that we're seeing or that you're experiencing in developing partnerships? What are some of the pitfalls or some of the, the, the things that we might not, if we were just here by ourselves, say, that we would talk to? And, and how do you overcome those challenges in partnership building? Well, an interesting thing that we've talked about is data, because data is so important for informed decision making, and yet access to some of that data for a university partner can be challenging. There's so many privacy rules, there's PUC regulations, et cetera. So um, being able to access that information to make those decisions is a, is a critically important part. And I'm just gonna use that as my number one talking point. And I, I totally agree with you, and I think, uh, I thought Ann did an outstanding job this morning in her presentation. And she made the point that a utility traditionally is subject to public policy, and that public policy for the most part is regulation. So when you're engaged in a partnership where you are heavily regulated and may be precluded from actually being an, a, a total participant in a project, and your potential partner does not have that regulatory overlay, it creates a different type of a relationship. Mm -hmm. I can give, get, get more expli explicit. So for example, and spoke to the notion of a microgrid. A microgrid is a mini uh, network uh, which has a power supply source and most of those power si supply sources today are renewable technologies backed up with batteries. Well, a utility, if you're in at what we call an organized market, if you're in the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland interconnection or in New York or in California and, and in other states, you are precluded from owning power supply. You were told to divest the power supply to create a competitive market. Now, and if you're trying to be a partner with someone who wants to build a microgrid, and you have the balance sheet that can sustain building that microgrid, and you want to keep that customer and demonstrate to that customer your commitment to resiliency, you are precluded mm -hmm. for the level of participation you can have in a microgrid. And I know that as a fact because I've testified in many of these proceedings. So what we need to do is extend that partnership in a way where our partner in the microgrid is able to demonstrate the value that I bring as a utility to helping them get that microgrid constructed. That's one example. Take another example, charging stations. In many states, a utility is precluded from owning and building charging infrastructure. <clears throat> so if you want to enhance uh, EV uh, penetration, you certainly need to have charging stations. It makes a lot of sense to me to have the utility be a partner in building the charging stations. So we figured out a way to get into this. We said, let's do pilots. Let's demonstrate that we add value and the concerns that others have about our participation do not outweigh the benefits that we bring to the table. Those are just several examples of how partnerships can be helpful but the utilities participation in those partnerships can be constrained by the regulatory process. Mm. Do, do you have to start to bring the regulators in as part of the partnership? Is that one of the, one of the ways that we overcome? I mean, kind of what you're leading to, David, is that we have all this technology out there, but the rules of the game are creating an impediment for us to make that penetration into the market. I mean, how are you guys starting to find ways to overcome that, either in kind of the sensor space or utility or with clean technology in particular? I could see that being an impediment. Yeah, I think for us in California, I mean, our utilities were also precluded from getting into the charging infrastructure uh -huh. game. Um, and so they had to go in front of the Public Utility Commission. They had to make their case. Uh, sdg &E was just approved last year to install 3,500 charging stations within our region. Um, it's part of their Power Your Drive program. Uh, they're doing it interestingly in, in that they are trying to incentivize drivers to charge when we have a lot of sun. We produce a lot of solar. We have more solar rooftop installations than any other city in the country. We've got to do something with all that power during the day. And the utility through their Power Your Drive program is trying to incentivize drivers to plug in 
uh, during the day uh, when we have an abundant amount of solar resources. But again, getting the approval to do that was a lengthy process, a costly process, um, and, and really an ongoing process. So there is that regulator, uh, the regulatory challenge that I think everyone faces. Uh, but just to touch on, if we're going to talk kind of the dirty stuff here, um, you know, I represent my organization, Clean Tech San Diego represents about 120 companies or, or uh, members, most of which are private sector companies. Those private sector companies trying to work within the boundaries of the university or the city or the utility is quite challenging. Uh, the, the universities, the cities, the utilities have created very large bureaucracies uh, that are very challenging for the private sector to work within. Sorry um, about that. So I think that's a you know that's not a regulatory thing. It's a it's a, a processy um, that that we need to real you know we need to figure out if we're going to really propel adoption of technology. Um, a lot of these kind of bureaucracies are not allowing for it, um, and that's something that we we have to turn upside down in order to to move this forward. I mean, on that bureaucracy front, so we we live in a time of of incredible opportunity for change. Uh, this new technology and what we can do with all all this data and. Is, is, is amazing. There are lots of places for us to focus our attention. One of the things that is so special about being in this room with all of you is, is that the level of collaboration in, in, in Pittsburgh and, and with uh, Carnegie Mellon and as a community that you have because you are rebuilding and because you are focused is a bet that we as a private company make on and taking a look around the room to say, are these people collaborating effectively, is it likely that there's going to be a positive outcome? Mm -hmm. And you have something very special here. And I think really making sure that you continue that uh, forward movement with you know, palpable progress is the thing that is necessary to, for, for companies that are figuring out where are my bets. Mm -hmm. Jason's doing an amazing job in San Diego. It's, it's, it's easy uh, to be in San Diego uh, because of the, this very effective organization that's been put together. It's great to be here because of the level of collaboration. So I, I, the dirty secret from our point of view is there's a limited amount of bandwidth and you've got to figure out where you're going to make your investments. And, and I would encourage you because this is a great place. That's interesting. Rich, maybe do you, I mean, on that with, with collaboration, I mean, you guys have some really key projects in the Duquesne Light Service Territory both in terms of smart meters and microgrids. I mean, and you guys have been partners on some of those too with ITRON. I mean, what, what kind of leads to that from your, your standpoint and your perch as the CEO of Duquesne Light in terms of making those decisions on which projects to advance versus where do I hold my gunpowder? Yeah, so, <clears throat> so we're trying to approach it uh, uh, taking a, what I would call a varied portfolio approach. Uh, so, as we talked a little bit about earlier, there are some regulatory constraints to go through. Uh, trying to get regulatory approval for something that's new and evolving is a very long process. It involves a lot of interveners coming in that want to carve out their space. So, one of the things that we've done, and we're approaching it from the perspective of developing pilot programs. So, we have an EV charging pilot program that we're doing. We have a microgrid pilot uh, program that we're doing. The, when you approach it from a pilot perspective, it's not as fast as you would like it to go, but what you're doing is you're teasing out, you know, all of the other stakeholder interests and where they may be coming from. You're teasing out regulatory challenges that may be there. You're teasing out the technology challenges that may be there so that you can kind of do a proof of concept and then accelerate through the process and hopefully win broad stakeholder support when you go in to ask for that regulatory change. Other things that we do, um, you know, we partner with the other utilities in Pennsylvania. You know, we all kind of have a kindred spirit of how we view the industry and our vision of where it's going. So together, you know, it's the voice of many, so to speak, where we try to get legislation introduced to knock down, you know, some of the barriers that are there. Uh, you know, we talked about some of the regulatory impediments. Uh, you know, and we talked a bit about, gee, I think, Grant, you were indicating you don't need to replicate the infrastructure two and three times, right? So you heard Ann talk a little bit earlier about the utility model. The way the utilities earn a return is you put plant in the ground, you earn a return on that investment at the end of the day. Well, when you think about it, you know, when we talk about uh, smart cities and smart meters that are out there, Duquesne Light is deploying, you know, a state-of-the-art communication backbone to, to gather all of that data from the smart meters that are out there. 
really doesn't make a lot of sense for the water company to de develop the same network, the gas utility to develop the same network. Using one network, you can kind of leverage that investment once because we're all serving the same stakeholders, right? But when you look at other utilities under that model, it's, gee, well, if I buy that service from Duquesne Light, I can't earn a return on it. So there's ways to overcome that. We'd have to go to the regulator and say, look, just because we're buying a service from a utility, they should be allowed to earn some type of synthetic return on that, right? This way we're getting a much more efficient, you know, deployment, you know, of capital. So I think those programs kind of, you know, tease some of those things out. And it's, it's going to be a slower process than you would like when you're involved, you know, with the regulated industry. Part of it's bureaucracy, as you indicated, and I think we're working hard to knock all of that down. We certainly are at Duquesne Light. But the regulatory process, really, we need an increased focus on the part of our regulators to kind of up their game a bit and, you know, start uh, being um, streamlining the processes, so to speak. But as we know, there's a lot of process involved, you know, in, 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 that, in, in that entire network. So, so maybe to build on that a little bit, and, and David, I'm going to pivot to you here. Is, you know, so regulations are put in place for a reason, right? You know, so that you're, you're trying to protect or, or, or provide some sort of continuity within a system. And one of the things that we talked about earlier is these ideas of challenges. You know, what are some of the challenges that you guys see in your organizations in terms of, um, you know, what's up ahead? What, what kind of, you know, what are you worrying about, whether it's like cyber threat or privacy, data privacy issues, and, and how are you starting to organize or marshal resources within your organizations to kind of prepare yourself for some of these, these challenges that lay on the horizon? So let me give a solution first. And I, I think Rich said it and others as well, that this whole notion of outreach and education, or let me say it differently, collaboration. So one of the things that Edison Electric Institute has been doing over the last 10 years is pulling regulators together with utility executives such as Rich, uh, putting them in a room and dealing with some very tough issues. And it's an off-the-record conversation. We have members of the financial community there too, and we deal with these cutting-edge issues so that the regulators get an understanding of how their regulations can be an impediment to the evolution and the adoption of technologies. That has worked, but as Rich said, that is a very, very, very slow process. Because there are hundreds of regulators throughout the United States. You can pull 10 regulators in if you, if you multiply that, it would take you 100 years. So there's got to be a better process. So the regulators get together three major times a year. So what we've tried to do at EEI is to have a session with them a Saturday session, they get into town early, we spring for lunch and have a dialogue on some of these big, big issues. Let me tell you what some of the big issues are, and you really started with one of them, cybersecurity. So as we digitize the electric system, and that's really what we're doing. We're making that electric system much smarter, much more accessible, much more customer driven. It means that there's a lot of information that is provided to the utility. The utility is the trusted advisor with the customer. Utility through that smart meter with AMI has a lot of information they see. But now there are a lot of other technologies that are plugging into that grid. Rich mentioned it. One essential platform, aside from a, from a communication platform, is the grid. All of these technologies feed into that grid. And that grid is being modernized. It's being upgraded. It's being digitized. So as you seek to do that, and you have all these different devices, all these different devices raise your cybersecurity risk. See, at the transmission level, there are mandatory enforceable rules. At the distribution level, they're not. I'm not advocating that you need them, but I'm just suggesting that there is an increased risk that now begins to be exposure to the utility. Utility wants to be way out in front and wants to serve the customer, wants to customize the services, wants to use the best technology they, they can, can to deal with resiliency and reliability and affordability. But they also acknowledge that as they do that, they're enhancing their cybersecurity risk. So there needs to be, some would say, best practices, 
there needs to be this recognition that we need to deal with this evolving challenge. Is this challenge bigger than the adoption of the technologies? I don't know. Uh, because we, I'm not going to say no system is perfect. So that's one risk. Uh, there's a second set of risks that are uh, they're technology risks. Rich mentioned it. He said, we don't necessarily take on the technology risks with one gulp. What we do is we do pilots. So there are a lot of technology risks that are associated with what we're talking about. And what the utility seeks to try to do is share those risks with someone else. And the regulator doesn't understand that because we have a cost plus model. We make an investment, we get a return on it. Our pricing model's got to change. We've got to incent behavior. If you, the earlier panel spoke about charging stations and the concentration of those charging stations at a time where they increase the demand on those substations. It means that you may have to increase the capacity or you have to use a different type of a pricing structure. And so we have to make regulation understand that a different pricing regime is very, very important. But as they're moving to that different pricing regime, if I'm a utility executive, if I'm rich, I want to make sure I get my allowed return. Rich isn't going to want to put his return uh, at stake for an experiment on pricing. So those are the kinds of things that we have to deal with. Rich, I want to go to you on this. I'm uh, going to go into some of the audience questions here. I get this nifty little tool that they gave me, so I'm going to take advantage of it. Um, you know, this is, from a consumer standpoint, uh, data itself doesn't seem to be, usage data doesn't seem to be risky. but. I mean, pick it up maybe with some of the things that David's saying, like, how do you guys look at systemic risk? It's a real windy day out there today. Um, we know Duquesne Light's working hard. The lights are on right now. Things are great. But that's not always the case when you're dealing with natural-born threats or others. I mean, can you talk a little bit about how you guys are working to harden the system and kind of reduce sure. some of these risks? Sure. So <clears throat> there's a lot of things that are going on. So you have kind of the physical risk to the system, and then you have the cyber risk to the system. So physically, you know, things that we're doing, um, there's a number of things we do to harden the system, to harden our substation. So that could be the infrastructure around the substation to protect it from somebody trying to do a bad thing to the substation. Uh, we take a look at the infrastructure of the, how we design our grid uh, so that we have redundancy built into the grid. We have two-way flows, so to speak, uh, that we don't have any radial feeds or we minimize the radial feeds that are out there. We have a lot of technology that we deployed. I mentioned earlier we have thousands of sensors in the field. Those are controlled through our SCADA system in our control room. So a good example of that is a lot of times when you see an outage, you may see your power go out for a minute or so and then it comes back on. That's our control room that's looking out there and seeing through the technology that we have, where is that fault located? And then they're isolating the system uh, remotely so that a good example of that would be 30,000 customers are out, but we have a fault in one location. They know where they can isolate it from the rest of the system, bring the power back up within minutes, and now you've taken 30,000 customers down to within a minute, down to 5,000 customers are out. Ultimately, you have to roll a vehicle out there to repair you know, what's out there, but that allows us really to significantly you know, reduce the outage time uh, that's out there. So there's a number of investments that we're making on the asset side, you know, on the physical side, and then on the technology side. On the cyber side, there's just a ton of investment that's going on and partnerships with EEI and other utilities, uh, the sharing of best practices. Our operational system that's out there that actually operates the assets in the field and the technology in the field is isolated from the outside world. So it doesn't connect to anything else other than into our control room. So we isolate it that way. As you start looking at the proliferation of smart meters and then the customer data and things that come out of that, we have to look at that a bit differently because there's desires for people to access some of that information. So when you think about cybersecurity, you know, you approach that from a number of different ways. You have multiple layers of defense for people trying to penetrate you. You kind of design your system like you compartmentalize it like a ship, right? If you have a rupture on a ship, you close doors inside it and you isolate it so that the ship doesn't go down. We look at how do we isolate and compartmentalize different systems within the company itself. And then on top of that, we need to start thinking about from a cyber perspective as we look at smart cities, I think that has to be approached um, uh, by the specific technology, the specific 
desires we need to do with that technology in the field. For example, you know, when we take a look at deploying all these sensors out there, if that data is coming in and we want to give people access to it but they can't control or do anything with it, that's one layer of security that you'll put around it. If you have control of it where you can actually go out there and take that data, look at where traffic flows are, now go out and start switching traffic lights and changing the sequence of it, that's a different level of control and protection that has to go around that. So I think it's, you know, as you look at it, you want to try to compartmentalize it and then apply the appropriate level of risk mitigation in each of those particular areas. You know, Jason and Philip, I mean, you're seeing it with kind of new startup companies developing new technologies. Itron's obviously been an established company for a long time. How, how are you guys looking at it, both from kind of a macro perspective, but also are you doing education with new companies who are just creating the new whiz-bang gadget in the clean tech sector? What's the both sides of that spectrum look like? So uh, Clean Tech San Diego launched the San Diego Regional Energy Innovation Network last year, which is a California Energy Commission. Is there an acronym to that? There is. Um, okay. there's a, which is a California Energy Con Commission funded program to support early stage energy entrepreneurs and help them get their product to market. The state of California has also set aside about $45 million to invest in these companies. Um, so if you have a startup and you want to bring it to San Diego, let me know. Um, but what we've done with that, that, um, that program, and probably the, the biggest and most important thing we've done, is we've brought the, universe, or the, uh, the utility to the table, we've brought the military to the table, we've brought these different uh, entities to the table that these companies are trying to help solve their issues. So they can hear firsthand from SDG&E, these are some of our internal and external threats that we're trying to face from an energy management perspective or a distribution perspective. Um, they can hear from the military and talk about microgrids and energy independence and what that means and how their technology may be able to fit into that. Um, so what we've done, you know, we like pilot pro programs and pilot projects in San Diego as well. Um, but you know, going back to this kind of notion of collaboration, when early stage companies can sit in a room in kind of a neutral space with the utility, uh, with the universities and others to talk about their technology and kind of the real world application of that technology, there's significant benefit in that. Um, and so I think these, these types of conversations not just happening here on a stage, but in a room with kind of the next round of innovators is, is uh, increasingly important. Um, and we're using those, that ability to facilitate those conversations and helping these technology companies um, develop a technology that actually has a market, um, and that market being around cyber, energy generation, energy management, whatever it may be. Okay. Philip? Yeah, a slight, maybe I agree with all these comments, but a slightly different take, which is uh, that uh, we feel that we're on the issue of security and privacy actually better off um, supporting industry standards and, and um, uh, uh, not trying to go it alone. Yeah. So, so, you know, we're working with best minds and standards bodies in order to establish a common set of standards and ask our partners and startups to conform to a series of privacy and cybersecurity and communications and other standards. We need to make innovation easy uh, and predictable in order to really stimulate it. And so there, when we talk about platforms, the rules have to be published. Um, mm -hmm. And then you have to have uh, third parties that can verify that the rules are being enforced. And so we have a number of uh, members in the audience from DOE as an example. We've worked with the defense labs on doing penetration analysis on the standards that we've used. Um, we're using standard technology building blocks that have been proven in other industries. Uh, financial markets as an example that have very high security requirements in which we're able to embed proven technology in some new sensor applications. But, but this stuff has been around for a long time. Um, so that we're leveraging uh, uh, huge technology investments. Uh, local example, Qualcomm in San Diego, you know, spends billions of dollars a year on R&D. When we have cellular uh, technology requirements, we're gonna, we're gonna draft off of the investments that they've made. So um, we're, we're collaborating on technology, driving standards, and, and using industry experts in order to ensure that things have gone properly. Great, thank you. So this, this uh, Slido thing's starting to look like my email feed. So you guys are percolating a lot of questions out there. So I wanna make sure that I get to some of them here. You know, Anna, you know, one of the questions from the audience here is about data awareness. Um, and, and maybe picking up with something that Jason was saying. Here at the Scott Institute in Carnegie Mellon, you guys are really building kind of the pipeline of the next generation of innovators that are gonna you know, work in companies like Duquesne Light and Clean Tech San Diego and EEI and ITRON. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the role of the Institute in terms of 
kind of formulating this next generation and, and not just tackling these big issues, but really creating the technicians that are going to fill in kind of the, the mindsets and, and build this next gener generation of applications. Oh, so the good news is that we have about 150 faculty that are working in energy-related uh, topics already, and many of those are collaborating, and that's one of the things that we're known for here at CMU is the level of sort of integration and collaboration between our um, different colleges. So when people come to us and they have a particular problem, we actually are able to pull the researchers together to sort of tackle issues. Um, we've done that a long time, uh, particularly with the Metro 21 um, and the deployment, sort of the way that they've handled that. Um, and the Scott Institute is sort of looking at some of those things as well. It's like, how can we be preparing? Because we know, even based on what Ann said this morning, you know, it's certainly not the, the utility of, of the past. Uh, the the skill set needs to be entirely different. And so the fact that we're strong in robotics and AI, machine learning, and cyber is an incredibly strong asset for a university like this one. So what I like the most about having all of you here, and thank you again for coming to campus, is the opportunity to hear you say those words. Because as much as we say that on a you know day to day basis, or within a class, or or you know within our daily work out in the community, uh, it's an important thing to hear from you all that that's what you're really looking for. Could I just w one super quick thing, Grant? Sorry, uh, to break this paradigm that suggested that there are sensors that communicate that you collect that information and then you analyze it afterwards. Smart sensors are probably going to be the future. We're talking about the next generation. We, we, we have to embed the intelligence out at the edge of the network and have these devices talking to each other. We are not going to control this new dynamic, volatile environment with one central brain. We're not going to, as InSoul's model is broken down on the generation side, central computing is broken down as a way to control this network that's got these dynamic generation devices on it. So, by uh, please think outside the box in terms of uh, the paradigm that you're using in thinking about next generation devices that, that, um, that they are smart, communicative, safe and secure, uh, economical, and last a long time, by the way. It's not an easy thing to build. But smart, intelligent, interoperable, all of those things. It's AI, that's what's gonna drive everything. You can look at all the improvements. A lot of improvements have been made in hardware technology. The next level of improvements are in software technology. Believe me, tremendous improvements that are taking place. So, so I got time for two more questions here, real quick. Um, you know, the one thing here, you know, one of the folks in the audience was asking, beyond pilots, what are some of the best strategies to deploy technology? And you know, this really makes me think about some of the challenges that we've seen in the city is that we can get the pilots up and running. The challenge we have is going to scale. So what are some things that you would kind of lend to the conversation maybe in you know, a quick minute or so in terms of how do you get the scale? How do we go beyond just the pilots? So I would say uh, from the city of San Diego perspective, again, going back to the pilot, that was a pilot with the street lights and the sensors, uh, the City IQ project, that started as a pilot. Uh, we're in year three now and it's a full scale project. I think the value of it's about 43 million. Um, so it started as a pilot and it actually became something real. I don't know that that necessarily happens all the time, mm -hmm. but I think what got it to where it was to where it is today is leadership from the city and a focus of the city to get it to where it is today, but also the ability of and the willingness of the private sector company, in this case uh, current by GE, to work with the city to make sure that the technology not only met the needs of the city, but also met the needs of their own needs. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it takes a champion on both ends to push it to the end um, and really see it be built to the extent that it should be um, as opposed to just remaining a small pilot program with a, a few learnings. Right. I agree with them. It's public policy leadership and we can give one good example and I'm not an advocate for saying you have to have mandatory renewable portfolio standards but it took a few regulators, I might be but I can't say that, it took a few regulators to say we need to move increasingly towards renewables. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to mandate it, OK? So that was public policy leadership, OK? It takes public policy leadership. And then on the other side, it takes someone with deep pockets. So if you're trying to move a technology forward very rapidly, you need a Bill Gates or someone else that believes in that technology, is willing to take the risk, put up the dollars, and someone who also has very uh, significant political persuasion. So I got, I got, I got the, the hook here, but I got one more question. I think my mom was in the audience, actually. Because the question is, how can energy utilities become better partners with municipalities 
We're working to increase sustainability and resilience, i.e. provide accessible data and streetlights. So I don't see my mom, but, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, we, we've had a great relationship with Duquesne Light, but I mean, across the board, I mean, where do you see kind of, where, where are these relationships taking us in terms of the partnerships between universities and utilities and cities? What's, what's the blue sky look for you? 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Uh, economic vitality. Focus on the outcome. Don't get hung up on the mechanics of how it's going to happen. When we come together to build more sustainable, livable, and successful cities, it will knock down the barriers that stand in the way of our collaboration. Terrific. I don't know that I have anything else to add to that. <laughs> it's perfect. I think so, too. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, when, we read his bio, when we read his bio, his visionary, that was perfect. Anna? So I would just say that, uh, that research and, and partnerships with U universities can be a big part of that. So we look forward to continued conversation, and we welcome um, the folks in the audience to be a part of that, too. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much to this panel. <laughs>